Thank you very much. Jennifer, thank you much. Jennifer asked me yesterday if it would be all right if we had a live Twitter feed, and I thought, well, I, how hard could that be? So I've been watching all of your eyes moving over to the other side of the stage as she was standing here, and I thought maybe that wasn't such a great idea. Oh, Max, we'll find you're more attractive than me. Well, no, we're going to find out the hard way, but I certainly appreciate the invitation. I'm so grateful everyone came to Indianapolis. David and Jennifer have led me out of the darkness over many years in terms of the application of new media to museums, and I'm thrilled that they cho chose to come here. And obviously grateful my whole team is here in full numbers. And colleagues uh, like Kathy Nagler, the director of the Indianapolis Museum of Contemporary Art, is he are here. So it's a great homecoming for old friends whom I've known for years and an opportunity to meet many new friends. So thank you once again. I would just start by saying that in terms of the museum visit on Friday, we do have a lot of galleries that will be open for your delectation. I hope you'll take full advantage. I know last night was a chance at the State Museum to catch up with each other, but please do make some time to go through what we have on offer. So I was asked to give a talk, broadly speaking, that wasn't just about what we're doing at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, which no infomercials needed, but more generally to think through some larger issues that we're all confronting and how museums are adapting to a world that includes live feeds. And I think the point I'm making in title about making something visceral is to remember that behind all of the applications that you are so creatively producing and all the ways in which the public is rushing to new ways of communicating and new ways of learning, that in the end for an art museum in particular, there is something we're looking for beyond exposure to things. And I simply put down a definition of visceral in terms of moving from virtual to visceral, felt in or as if in the viscera <laughs> or deep or dealing with crude or elemental emotions. And I think it's very difficult sometimes when most museums like mine tend to define ourselves through this kind of description um, of the number of objects and staff and budget and endowment and acres and visitors and say, well, that's, that's who we are, very clearly, that's our museum. I'm showing a slide of us, an aerial slide that shows the museum proper down here and the rest of the 152 acres uh, around it. But I think it's very difficult to translate something as complicated as an endeavor with all of those attributes online and do so in a way that sticks and has some resonance and encourages you to come back and experience it because if we get too caught up in the plumbing of technology and we forget the outcomes, obviously that's self-fulfilling. And for most of you who are out solving problems of how to communicate and how to connect educators and visitors and curators and objects, the real challenge has to be in the foreground of what features of a museum need to be online, not just what information. So what I wanted to do this morning is just remind us all that certainly in an art museum, this is part of what it, at our museum we're focused on is these guys and, and women, very few of them I would add women, but we have, in, in terms of the bragging rights of which artists are represented in depth or in some priority. If you look at this and see it as a, a tag cloud, it isn't quite that. It's actually hallmarks of individual achievement over thousands of years that rank, uh, we think, in a certain way in relation to our peers. But if we get too tied up with tag clouds, we end up losing the piece of it behind all that, which is the human ingredient. And so at pulling off of Creative Commons, Flickr images, uh, racing around, looking it up for what's in our museum, seeing the public experience of our grounds and collections is clearly something that all of new applications are making possible. And finding our way into museum spaces online that are not evident for the visitor, since so much of what goes on behind the scenes, and this is not our museum, it's another paper conservation lab, but so much of what goes on behind the scenes is critical to the experience in the front of house. And it seems to me it's imperative for us to make that available to our visitors since they won't see it when they get there. And there might as well be a way to provide that uh, before they arrive and after they've come. And libraries that all of us tend and care for, this happens to be the Seattle Public Library, which I love because Rem Koolhaas did such a wonderful job with it. But museum libraries are, with the Arliss Conference coming to town uh, in the next few days, next day and a half, 
are also a critical part of what we have and what we do, but I think, again, the public isn't constantly aware of how much is behind that. And then there are storerooms, which are packed with goodies. Normally about 95% of our goodies in most museums of, of art are in storage. And the misnomer there is so much of it is works on paper, which can't be seen for a prolonged period of time, that that statistic is misleading. But getting people into our storerooms is also an important thing that we can offer online to whet the appetite and to educate lawmakers, policymakers, funders about the challenges we all face in maintaining cultural heritage in ways that aren't evident and sexy in an exhibition tour online or in other features that we naturally uh, want to attend to as well. And here's an ID tag from a volunteer at the Computer History Museum. We can't forget all of the volunteers at all of our institutions who throw themselves at this enterprise and make their contributions felt day in, day out, who get literally nothing from us in material terms, but they're an enormous swath of the public who could be continually engaged in what museums provide and finding ways to keep volunteers engaged, not just professionals and not just museum goers as an abstract category, seems to me something, particularly in, in this country where there are so many volunteers, a worthwhile effort. I guess it comes down to thinking about where the web has gotten to in looking at bringing features alive, not just representing statistics and information such as museum hours or virtual exhibitions, which are after all conceits that curators have created which belong in a museum and we've sought over years to try to translate into an online experience, but they're really only one experience that we need to offer. So I just wanted to whip through some of the things that happen on site at museums and try to remember as we're developing tools for experience online that these are opportunities for us to present as well. Here's a fellow doing a sketch at a museum. And I just put down here a, another picture from Flickr of a little boy reaching his finger out to a little girl uh, under the title of flirting, gossiping, looking, shopping, and eating. And I think looking is in the middle there, wedged somewhere among all the activities that take place at museums but clearly it's not most of what we do in museums and yet the entire focus that we have in the provision of access online tends to be focused on looking. But I, I ask the question, is it heresy to admit that looking and learning are only a small part of a museum visit? Certainly the rat race that we've created for everyone in parking and checking coats and getting tickets and looking in maps and later on getting coffee and going to the store it does occupy most of the time. And the ways in which visitors can be instructed to learn, this is a photograph from North Korea of uh, our fearless leader there with a group of North Korean students admiring a mural of, of the leader of North Korea. And that's one way, certainly, we can provide access to visitors around the world. But George Hine wrote this wonderful book many years ago, which has been reprinted, in which he describes visitor survival curves and the ways in which we create paths for visitors and institutions, not necessarily physical paths, but other kinds of pathways, are problematized today through museum studies efforts and through the efforts of educators and visitor services staff as opportunities to construct a narrative. But at the same time, we all recognize this is not the normal approach to museum attendance and visitation, and I think we're all grateful for that. We should be looking to provide a more a kind of optimistic approach in which choice and opportunity governs a lot of what happens rather than our doing what uh, we think the public demands. This is a snapshot of the Museum of Drag Racing, which is what it normally feels like when you're in an art museum where the American Association of Museum posits uh, from many studies that the average amount of time in front of a work of art is three seconds. So in that wonderful time, that three second moment when you're apprehending the label, and glancing at the picture to confirm that that is indeed what you've just read about, not exactly the experience we are all building towards in what we provide access for, whether it's in printed materials, in the galleries, or online. But that's the reality of so much of attendance, that there's really precious few moments when people linger in front of objects and drink of them as objects, and so much of it is a museum of drag racing. And at the same time, it isn't clear that that's the worst thing in the world. This is a slide from Brazil of a university, and the question I posit is, what is the percentage of time learning versus living in a university? So here you have a scene in a computer lab in Rio de Janeiro. 
and obviously there is something going on here. I'm sure there's learning going on too, but so much of what happens in college, after all, if we distill all the time people are devoting to their studies, is extrinsic to learning. It's also socializing, it's being in the presence of others with like attitudes or competing attitudes. And I don't think we should run away from that constantly. I think it's fair to give permission to that kind of experience in institutions, which is how we can make a bond with visitors that's visceral and not just virtual. We all are eager to provide orientation information for visitors, and it's certainly something that most of the efforts in technology have been devoted to. And here is just a slide showing a temple in the wilderness with all the things you are not allowed to do. There are ways in which experiential and learning environments are compromised by excessive orientation. And I think so much of what you've been devoted to as a field is giving people choices in orientation, which is, I think, a great direction. But that too can be overwhelming. And allowing those choices to be more muted and to be less overwhelming for visitors who really are not interested in being told how to experience things through technology is something to keep in mind as well. It's no longer a generational issue. I think there's so many parents and grandparents who want to stay in touch with kids and grandkids through uh, the internet that they're piling on. And my 13-year-old is in active communication with his 80-year-old grandfather online. There's a new world of opportunity in that as well. But at the same time, clutter is probably the biggest problem we face, whether it's clutter in experiential terms, uh, witness what's going on to my right, or the ways in which, as experiences in galleries, in museum uh, auditoria, we're really being torn constantly by stimuli. And if we can try to dial down visible stimuli, I think we'll be better off. An example of that is, is the very phrase, virtual museum programs. There are times in which they become uh, more of interest to us as educators and curators and technologists than to the visitor. And we fall in love with technology solutions that provide a simulacrum of something which is in real time and space. But it isn't obvious that they always have the desired or intended effect, Either, whether it's because we become interested in those programs to the exclusion of the actual experience or whether it's because we're devising some perfect incubated experience that a member of the public is perhaps not wanting or needing. So looking at mapping, and mapping is so much a part of what we do in the use of new technologies, it's still a map. And what I'm appealing towards is something which is more sensuous and personal and behind the velvet rope, which is truly where technology can lead us beyond the experience of what to expect on site. Databases have been obsessing us all. I've certainly been first among equals as a museum director in thinking about how to make sure whatever information we're capturing and creating and disseminating is accurate. But I also arrived here three years ago and heard, as is so often the case, the mantra that we're only going to put stuff online when we've done data cleanup. I don't know if that expression rings with anybody else. And I said, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to put everything online now, and we're going to see how much we have to clean up. And that seems to be working better, I think, than holding back. But at the same time, publishing databases and publishing information about our collections in the ways that we, as registrars and curators, want to see that information develop, it's just a baseline. It's just the beginning of something. And having thousands of images, whether they're high resolution or not, with all the ancillary information, is for a lot of our visitors not much different from the credits at a movie theater. They're helpful if they want to know, they're interesting, but that's not necessarily what they're looking for. And unfortunately, it becomes something that's necessary but not sufficient. And yet, so much of our time has been devoted to just building the ground floor of this building and haven't gotten further along to something else which is experiential and, as I say, taking visitors to the movies instead of showing them the credits. So what I hope all of us are working towards as we move on in building these platforms and building the baseline for information exchange is to go beyond the virtual to something which is tactile and sensual and allows you to think about creativity in a different way, allows you to understand how, in terms of museology, what we collect is so often an act, an artifact of some time ago or recently that has stories behind it. And telling those stories becomes the key issue, not so much reflecting them in digital format and assuming we've accomplished enough. 
So with a Wayne Thiebaud picture on after that other dessert, I think we have to continually ask ourselves what those avenues are to achieving something visceral in a museum visit. We did a Wayne Thiebaud show at the Whitney many years ago, and it was nothing but acres and acres of pies and cakes and ice cream. And it was a fantastic exhibition, and you really were, after the show, ready for a treat. But I think we need to be doing more of that online, and we need to be wetting an appetite online. This is a billboard in Hungary, you may have seen, of Bruegel King. And uh, it was a parody, a parody, of course, of the commercialization of how culture is being retrofitted in Europe to a model more akin to the United States model of a commercial package with all the entrepreneurship that we've been selling. And I just wrote a piece in the Giornale dell'Arte this month urging the Berlusconi government not to rush headlong into efforts that are mirroring American practices in art museums and museums in general and urging us to maintain a sense of the overarching educational mandate of museums as opposed to its potential commercial value and the ways in which today in Italy there's so much debate about privatization of institutions as the goal, but as we know in the United States, privatization ends up also taking away the possibilities of adventure and play when it's always reduced to the bottom line. So I think if we can devote some energy collectively as a field to pushing away commercial intrusion and attempts at mind control that are natural to institutions with stores, with commerce, with tickets, with this hiss and crackle, food and beverage, and all the other things that we've been highlighting in our expansions, and get back to something which is behind the scenes by, secondly, encouraging voyeurism, uh, showing staff in action. It's something that the public doesn't get a chance to do. We, we hustle right before opening hours to finish our work in the galleries, and then we let the public in. But of course, what people would really like to see is how all this came to pass, and what are the ways in which museums operate and function. That's why CSI, the television series, has been such a hit, is people are curious about behind police work, how is it all done, what's behind it, and we need to take a cue from that appetite and enthusiasm seems to me we also need to enjoy being near original objects, and so much of what we end up presenting is a pasteboard mask in front of original objects of explaining and providing access to information and missing the fact that they're actually standing in front of something that is consequential in time, that has a value that goes beyond its illustrative properties. And reveling in that in some way seems to me something that technology should make possible. Also, going to museums can be about projecting yourself into another time and place or another, as Rem Koolhaas calls it, another condition, and looking for ways in which we disorient a visitor by giving them permission to move away from their comfort zone of a stable force in front of an inert object receiving its message and instead encouraging visitors to have playtime and dream time and think about the implications of what we collect and display beyond the pure illustration of the march of time in art history or of the history of a particular discipline or in a history museum the evidence of, of what we've accomplished over time. I also think allowing visitors to have that permission will lead to savoring and retaining memories and an empathetic response. The empathetic response is really the memory maker. And if you're in a history museum in context and you see a bunk bed from World War II and the picture of a loved one back home, that experience of going into a place like the Churchill Museum in London where you're really transported into a place and time that you're allowed to imagine yourself in, we need to do that in all kinds of museums in all kinds of ways because that empathetic response is the lasting one, the one that can really map itself to uh, experience for um, all time. And if you look at a panel painting on the left at the Metropolitan Museum of the High Renaissance uh, with Virgin and Child and look on the right and see a fairly typical Beaux-Arts office building and recognize that you have the same frame in the architecture, it's just one way of helping a visitor apply the memory they've had and that empathetic response to their daily lives so that as they leave a museum and they go out in the world, they don't just take the painting in the middle of that frame, they take the frame with them in their mind's eye. They recognize that almost everything we put on view in institutions, we do so because out of a deliberate sense, we believe they have a lesson 
embedded in them. But finding a connection between that lesson at that moment in that museum and its application to life after the exit from the museum seems to me a critical piece of reinforcing what it is we provide, of looking for the extensions of learning beyond the experience on site. And that clearly is where the online world offers possibilities. So one of those outcomes would be to teach connoisseurship at the mall, to allow people literally to leave a museum, and an art museum in particular, and go out and be able to apply standards, aesthetic standards, standards of learning around quality and visual achievement, and the synergistic power of objects and ideas to take it literally to the mall, to be more discerning in life choices, to use the learning that they've had informally or formally in a museum and apply it to something other than that single experience in the museum. That's how we'll become more important and consequential in people's lives. So I guess I look for a scenario which is not adding another barrier between the visitor and the contents of the museum. We've already mentioned the barrier of parking, checking coats, ticketing, eating, shopping. Orientation can end up being another barrier on site. So why don't we try to do more of that online and try to encourage visitors in various ways get, to get ready for that visit beforehand. We have a program here with every third grader in the public school system that goes through the school year they are studying a couple of dozen works of art in the classroom to learn about artistic intention, to learn about the strategies of art as, a, as an example of communication. And then we're now in the sweet spot of the three weeks of the year when all 4,000 kids pile into the museum with their teachers and see the very objects that they were studying online. And then we give them memberships to their families so they can be the teachers and they can bring back their families. They can orient their families at home before they come to the museum. And that seems to me a method that works to get children and young people invested in teaching their parents through an online service that it, I believe is important and lasting. So what I think is great is before a visit is to look at paths you might take to become more familiar with an institution, and then we get back to the conventions of maps and orientation and virtual exhibitions, which are completely legitimate and important features. But I think getting them to be used in a way that plans for a visit, but they're not necessarily constantly used during the visit would be a great thing. And giving them an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to go behind the scenes and not just see what they're going to see, but also understand the mechanics of how we operate. It's also an important feature for all of us in these times to show lawmakers, policy makers, funders, philanthropists, foundations, how complicated it is to run museums, that it's not as simple as switching on the lights and admiring things. Those behind the scenes experiences therefore have a dual purpose. They help us at a time of economic privation, make a case for ourselves, and they help the visitor become more engaged with our life before they arrive. So I don't think on site you should do other than encourage visitors to deviate from a path that they thought they might follow. Encourage them to have that experience of improvisation and play and no need really to examine the institution that way as something that is a frozen path through time. That may be the way we install our collections, which is a problem we all face. The taxonomy of experience around historical and art historical and natural history collections but it doesn't mean that the visitor has to be tied to that. And we need to make room and permission for people to experience collections that way. So obviously after the visit, we also have to find ways to entice visitors to join everything from what today is a Facebook group, tomorrow maybe something else, and use our wonderful aspirational possibilities in technology to enrich and to build and to make sure that they return. Because the premise shouldn't be that visitors are only on site for one visit and they feel they've experienced an institution, the premise should be we want to be part of your lives. We want to make sure that's a feature of choice that you'll make going forward. So, turning to another element of how we can encourage uh, participation, I think one thing that museums have not been particularly focused on is telling the truth. We've been very good at promoting and marketing and cheering ourselves on. But I think telling the truth is a pretty powerful thing in any context. And it's certainly what we've been trying to do in looking at the IMA's opportunities through a dashboard. So 
I'll show you a few screen captures of that, but I'll just acknowledge that for a staff person, for all of us who work in museums, what's visceral is shining a light on how far you have to go, not just what you've got to show off. And that's where the discomfort begins for all of us. Is So what does that actually mean in terms of how far you have to go? We recently had a layoffs of uh, about almost 24 people at the museum. And so immediately our dashboard reflected the number of employees on our employee count dropped to 299. But in providing the information about employee count, it's not just the number of bodies in an institution now. You can read down this and see in each department how many people work in a particular area of expertise. And there's long been an argument that if a museum has more people in development than it does in the educational curatorial side, that culturally it's bereft of something at its core that matters. So I didn't really know, looking at this, how we would appear as an institution when we broke out our staff by department. But that's part of the point, is you're not really sure necessarily when you reveal everything about yourselves what the impact is going to be. You may be learning yourselves, as one often does, by those kinds of revelation. Similarly, with our endowment, which was not so very long ago a much bigger endowment, it's still a very big endowment, when the press was calling around at the height of the economic travails three months ago asking how people's endowments were affected, our public relations officer said, well, it's, it's on our website. And not only that, if you look at our website, you can see where it was uh, in August at the bottom right and make your way up to the top left. And it's a pretty precipitous decline, but it never occurred to us to do other than share that information when times were great. And similarly, we can't afford to not show it when times are lousy. But also in reflecting the truth about institutions, one of the truths that we need to get out to our visitors is that the permanent collection, which is this deadening phrase that sounds like that granite block you're going to walk into, isn't permanent. So we have a refreshment every month of new works of art on view in our galleries month to date. And then with images, you can click on and find your way to those to remind people here with this George Romney portrait that objects are not permanently on display. They come out of storage, they're restored and conserved, they're lent, they're borrowed, and they're acquired. And that pace and rhythm of life is something that I think can create a sense of opportunity for people to not just come to big boffo exhibitions with lots of advertising, but to recognize that permanent collections are invitational as well. We also put together uh, two years ago the beginning of an ongoing count of visitors. And we seek to be very clear about what this means. Because when you ask a museum director, what's your attendance, they'll answer you. But they won't necessarily say, and we don't really think that's true, but that's the number we quote. Because how do you quote and count attendance? Is it by clickers, by guards who are distracted and answering a question and not really clicking? Or then they catch up with several clicks? Is it, as in our case, by electronic eye or a heat cage, really, that we then discount by the number of staff and volunteers? Or is it, in some museums, literally an estimate, which is my favorite kind of counting? <laughs> kind of like the crowd estimates at protests. And by the way, if any of you are sticking around, we have a huge rally on Monday at noon in Monument Circle to protest, um, or I should say to advocate the arts and hope that we'll get some attention. So if you happen to want to revisit the 60s or imagine what it was like, We'll <laughs> hope to have you there at high noon with a great opportunity for celebration. But nobody's going to be counting the visitors there this way. Our intent in doing it is to get past the premise that attendance is the ultimate arbiter of success by making it banal, by making it an, a daily, hourly, even every five minute increment of the number of warm bodies who pass through an institution. But what I've also said a great deal after we launched this a couple of years ago is that this doesn't mean the number of people, because some people, co believe it or not, go out for lunch and come back. And some people actually, in the course of a year, might visit six times. So this notion that you can count attendance is a, is a very problem problematic one. And it's for that reason that we launched another approach, which is to ask not just about how many warm bodies cross the threshold, discounted by staff and volunteers, but where are they coming from? So since we're free, it's very hard to trap our visitors at all times. We have nets, and we go around the entrance and seek to do so. And we ask everybody we can find what their zip code is. 
So what we've started to build <clears throat> is a, a map, an interactive map, that shows what we call museum admissions, which means people who check in at the front desk for one reason or another, whether it's to go to the theater, to buy a ticket to a special exhibition, which is the only part of our collection that we do charge for is the temporary exhibitions. And what you see are little icons and a familiar uh, map interface of where our visitors come from with the color reflecting how many people come from that zip code. And of course, it starts to get interesting. This is data from January through early March of the density of visitors we have, of course, from Indianapolis, which you would expect, and then the suburbs and so on. And then you get to the interesting part, which is the socioeconomic data of what those zip codes imply. And here you see what you can click on there is not just their zip code, but their education, their income, their age, their marital status, their occupation, and their ethnicity. And so our goal in doing this is not to, again, champion how many people come in the door and how widespread vaguely on a map it looks, but what neighborhoods are not coming. How do we reach the neighborhoods that are not represented in this map is what we're focused on in visitor studies. Because you can look at a map, it becomes very dizzying when you start looking at the icons, or you can get very full of pride and puff out your chest and you see each of these icons now represents a state. And this is how many people around the country have visited the Indianapolis Museum of Art since January from all these states. Until recently, we had no Montana visitors, but I'm glad to say that's been cured. So <laughs> those sort of statistical porn information pieces are great fun, but they don't actually tell you what you need to know, which is who isn't visiting and why aren't they, and that's the baseline we're trying to build. Another feature of what we're eager to do in telling the truth in a way of making institutions feel more part of your life is talking very openly about our collections and doing so not just of what we have, but what we're about not to have. So we made a decision some time ago with regard to deaccessioning, which is quite a hot topic even today in light of the Montclair Art Museum's decision yesterday to sell a, a body of objects in order to meet their bond issue standards. We decided to, of course, put our policy on deaccessioning very clearly on the web, which is a no-brainer. And that's evident here about the reasons we sell and exchange and transfer works of art. But then we decided to go at another step and put up a database of the works that we plan to deaccession, as well as the ones that we have deaccessioned, and reveal all the information that we think is of any use that would include, of course, a description searchable by title artist, searchable by year of acquisition, searchable by the time of deaccessioning, which simply means the Board of Governors said, yes, this can now leave the collection. And then sometimes there's a gap between that deaccession date and the far right in the transfer notes, the auction date. And then the recipient, whether it's an auction house uh, here locally, less likely except for very insignificant objects, or uh, Christie Sotheby's Phillips in New York. And then the, the scary part, when you here is just searching across paintings that we've sold recently, third from the top is a painting by Domenico Panetti, acquired in 1924, sold at Christie's on January 28th, 2009. And then you get to that page and the auction sale price was $7,000 and uh, the, all of the information one could possibly have about the picture uh, that was part of our collection is there. I actually was speaking at the World Bank recently and someone there walked up to me and said, I just bought a painting that I, of yours and I uh, saw it online and went and before it was sold and went after it. And So the uncomfortable feeling for me is that we're shilling for deaccessioning <laughs> when all we're really trying to do is be very transparent about a very problematic uh, area of activity in museums because there's so much difference of opinion about what it's for and what it, where the limits should be. But our next chapter, which will be in the next few days really, is to link those objects that have been deaccessioned and the funds that were realized applied to new acquisitions. So you'll be able in the next few days to click on this picture, for example, and find your way to an artwork that we've acquired with funds realized from its sale. So that's the kind of painful search information that both the, from a public point of view, from journalists, from museum studies people, from peers and colleagues, from public officials who are entrusted like attorneys general to monitoring our behavior, we think it's important to get out in front and be truthful about and be prepared to defend uh, and understand for, for many reasons that that defense may not be adequate for some people. There's another element of transparency which is inaccuracy. And that can occur as here with Charity Navigator. I don't know if anyone here is associated with Charity Navigator. 
hoping not. Uh, and I, I say that because this was a search done uh, a couple of weeks ago of the top rated art museums in the United States by Charity Navigate. We came out as number one in the United States. So there we are ahead of LA County and Santa Barbara. And, and one of my colleagues in the Association of Art Museum Directors issued a press release because his or her museum was ranked with, I think, four stars by Charity Navigator. <clears throat> well, I am here to publicly disavow this rating because it's built on a hill of sand. The way Charity Navigator works, which is meant to be a very transparent, effective tool to allow people who are prepared to give money away to go see how effective a charity is. They looked at our operating results from a particular year and saw that we took in a lot more money than we spent and they thought we must be incredibly efficient. Well, we were in a capital campaign. We were raising buckets of money to pay for a building. We built the building, and then we were back to you know, the next year, a fairly stable operating basis. So by that logic, we would be downgraded. So all I'm suggesting is don't trust, of course, what you see on the web. And look for resources. And even here, this ostensible tool that we're all meant to worship and use, and philanthropists often talk about in their giving that they've looked on Charity Navigator and they've seen that you're a responsible institution, the methodology is completely flawed. So, again, I disavow that rating because I also know in a year we'll be down to number whatever. So I think we need to present those statistics ourselves. We shouldn't be waiting for someone else to be the arbiter of our fortunes. And by putting our tax returns right on our website, downloadable, our premise is simply that feel free to have a look. And of course, this year's tax returns for 2008 in the United States <clears throat> returns are going to be very juicy because the Form 990 that we file, which is the US form for tax-exempt organizations, includes all kinds of sexy details about people's lives and what they enjoy in terms of benefits and salary and all sorts of other things. So it's going to be a fascinating read for the prurient. And at the same time, it's what we're all doing. And it's what we need to be doing as institutions, is making that information available right away. Why wait for guidestar.org which, if you don't know it, is a terrific resource that publishes this information about a year after it's been filed with the IRS. We publish it as soon as it's been submitted to the IRS. I'll just close with an observation about there, the fact that there are several other projects and organizations busily at work thinking about these kinds of issues of openness, of working to make institutions much more part of our lives, and less about being institutional. And the Steve Project, which so many of you have worked hard to make a success, is a, was a fascinating beginning point to look at tagging as an opportunity for public engagement, involvement, and comment in a way that would actually change the language of art historians, that we could begin to describe works of art in ways more empathetic with the way that people who aren't art historians talk. And the salutary effect is that when in the past you would look at the description of a work of art online and be astonished to see someone might be referring to its contents in ways that were unscientific, unscholarly, today you recognize that that's how you're going to move to the head of the line in search. That's how a Google return will find you uh, more quickly. And instead of issuing this and being terrified that language about the precious objects we care for may be used in terms that aren't scientific and professional. We should remember that opera in Italy in the 19th century was a raucous affair with people throwing fruit at the stage and shouting and booing, and that was authentic Italian opera in the 1850s and 60s. And now opera is this very antiseptic experience, applauding for everything, pretending everything is equally good. We shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't make that mistake in museums. We should be allowing the world of tagging to influence how we perform, to recognize that when things are lobbed our way, we've got to look at catching them. The, I won't go into depth about Art Babel, which we launched here a few days ago, and yet behind it is a premise. The premise is, yes, there's going to be a lot of great video content uh, put in one place now more efficiently than before. But to me, that wasting time on watching Twitter feeds or watching video isn't necessarily what we're after. We're after something a little more surgical than that. So here is an interview we did with Maya Lin, who did a 100-foot-long permanent commission at the 
IMA uh, last year. And we did the, trans, the transliteration, the transcription of her video. And the point is, in the search terms, in the transcription, is where I see the magic of Art Babel. Because I just did a, a quick Google search, and I admit I fiddled with it a little bit to get the result. But um, <laughs> I put in Maya it's Lin, Art Babel. OK, I confess. But what I wanted to show in the very top line is that in 1 minute 31 seconds into the video, Maya utters the phrase, in 1981, I was, I think, still in college when I made this. And so the premise with Art Babel is that somebody's going to be searching for Vietnam Memorial in X months, and the Google search result will turn up that stop, that second, in the Art Babel video, in the interview, and that viewer will be taken to that. And that's what we really are excited, or I'm very excited about is not just the enjoyment of so much wonderful production value and thoughtful uh, efforts by our colleagues around the country and around the world in producing video applications, is that incrementally these conversations, these recordings of experience, whether by visitors or professionals or artists, can become part of the visual language, the written word that we're so accustomed to using in search. So for me, that's the most exciting part about it. But so many other organizations around the country and around the world, like New Curator here with the powerhouse, uh, recognition of powerhouse documentation, all being under Creative Commons license. Huge change and a huge acknowledgement that we've got to move to a platform which is less protective, less about IP protection among our peers, and more about the promulgation of information and knowledge, since after all, we're not here to make a profit. Or as we think about the mattress uh, factory and here, uh, a wonderful feature of visitor conversations in a confessional structure uh, in which museum visitors are invited to broadcast their answers to the question, what does the mattress factory mean to you? So many institutions are thinking about the invitation to the public to participate in ways that are reshaping the formality of museums and breaking it down to being more of places of invitation. And of course, the Brooklyn Museum has been exemplary in thinking about the use of author of user-generated content, including here the exhibition Click, a crowd-curated exhibition, which you may have seen last summer, uh, a show that really invited visitors to participate in shaping. And of course, for the purists among us, it's just, it just causes shudders uh, of fear that we're yielding the authority of institutions to the masses and the herd and the flock. Uh, but I think that's exactly what makes it so compelling is thinking about the ways in which visual traditions are not owned by any one party in any institution. And frankly, the accidents of fate that art museums are, that our collections are simply the result of individual collectors in this country being generous to us. Uh, and we only acquire 10, maybe 15% of what we own by purchase. Most of what we acquire is by gift, by accident. And in terms of a crowd curated exhibition, uh, one isn't really sure what will develop from that. Brooklyn also is deeply engaged in thinking about sorting its information the way you want it, which is a terrific way of looking at institutional information, is making it personal, making it relevant to your lives, and thinking about how to compel a visitor to use it in their daily life. Tate, of course, has been, uh, since very early days, thoughtful about visitor experience online. I also think so highly of what they do on site. They pioneered some years ago these pamphlets, if you ever saw them, of specific tours you could take. I think one was, I think, I just broke up with my girlfriend tour. And so then you could make your way through the collection in a way that was syncopated with personal life experience and find some solace in these great objects in their collections. But they've always been adventurers and, and thoughtful about them. And Rob Stein and Daniel and Candela and my team were the, uh, the source of, of some of the inspiration for all of this. And this is Build a Squid uh, on Te Papa, their blog. And I haven't, I confess, looked at it. But I have complete faith that Rob and Daniel will write this is something to spend time on in terms of the ways that visitors can become engaged, not just in the creation of, of content, but also its provision in a way that's visible to all as Flickr has, of course, done. And I always look at commercial applications and think, how long is that going to be around? Uh, reading a few days ago about the imminent demise of YouTube and the fact that they lost almost half a billion dollars this past year at Google does make you wonder. So the premise that we all should have, I believe, as institutions is not to bet the farm 
on commercial applications that may merge or go away. We've got to make sure we're also riding on top of that with something sustainable that we have behind all of that, a means to go forward, which is our own, of our own creation. So I, that's all I had to share this morning, and then Jennifer promised me I could sit down, and if you have some brickbats to toss my way, I'd be happy to try to catch them. I think one of the things you can't do is watch the tweets and talk. You seem to be able to watch the tweets, listen, and tweet. But all of the things together are, are a bit too much. Um, it was fascinating, Max, that you mentioned the mattress factory, because one of the people who's tweeting is Jeff at the mattress factory. Can someone shout out for him? And he picked up on one of the themes that you talked about a lot through there, which was about you know the personal and the institutional, the informational and the experiential. And he was you know, starting to play on this question when he, I think, asked the question about the role of museums in the virtual world. Because so much of what we think of as visceral involves an immediate connection with an object and almost some physical presence. And if that's not there, what do we get instead? And how do we use the technology to evince some of that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't pretend to know the answer to that because every collection is different, every object is different, and I would imagine that for each of you, you go to you go to museums, you visit them with a different purpose and intent. My appeal is simply not to get locked into a formula that's so easy to be locked into, whether it's because the director and curatorial staff, who tend to be the top bananas in a lot of institutions, are saying, this is the solution we think we need, and then you don't feel the freedom to push back and say, well, that may be what you think, but we think the public actually wants something different. So I'm encouraging you to be bold and adventurous and push back when you have that institutional imperative provided to you and to look for experiential hooks into the life of a museum, which aren't necessarily intuitive, which may be off the beam and which may be playful or irreverent and understand that definitely some of that won't involve the objects in the museum. They may involve the curatorial practice itself, they may tease out of that the complete arbitrariness of curatorial taste and choice in the provision of collections or their display. I think the, for us the issue started with a conversation about what should not be available. And we, I said probably medical records, I would say don't see the purpose of putting those online. But anything else is game, fair game, and it depends on how important it's felt by members of our staff. Do you know who else is looking at, at those statistics? Do you anecdotally find out that your Indianapolis public is, is as engaged as, as we all are in looking through that back door? Well, we do look with Google, Google Analytics at who's spending time doing what, and it's pretty broad-based. I think definitely there is a lot of interest locally, but the interest is it's pretty distributed, I think, as a function of some press coverage initially for it, but also, in general, just the oddity of a place of its own volition revealing so much that isn't puff uh, is a nice point of departure. Well, some, some real facts are great. We have, we have a question at the mic. We've tried to automate the dashboard in a certain way, but the problem with automating it too much is nobody looks at it, it just appears. And there may be errors, there may be sins of omission in providing context. So Rob Stein's team is actively looking at ways in which the databases that fuel the dashboard are automated, but that there's always a look by a human being to understand if something went wrong with the feed, for example, from the attendance counter, that may have been uh, off, and that, that has happened at times, and we've had to go back and, and f fiddle with it. But I think the core is to distribute responsibility for the information on it widely, not just to our chief information officer and his staff, but to all the departments, to development, to education, to registration, to finance, so that everyone who is responsible for publishing what they're doing has the ultimate responsibility for the accuracy of it. And then it takes gadflies like me or Rob or, or others to, to notice when something looks awry. And it, of course that does happen and catch them up on it. But the change is cultural. The change is an acknowledgement throughout the museum that this is what we do. This is how we review our performance. This is how we assess how well we're doing in particular ways. And we're constantly thinking about ways to change it 
to be more reflective of what matters, not just what can be measured, but what matters. And also conscious of the fact that it should be a tool for management. It shouldn't just be something that is transparency for its own sake. Well, I did a video recently, just I think it was no more than 30 seconds. Basically, it was appealing for money with a button at the bottom of the video to contribute. It was really a late night infomercial for the sham, what is that cloth called? The, a chamois? Uh, a chamois, or you know, the... <laughs> the miracle cloth. You yeah. all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, building on the ways in which we're open and transparent is more in conversations, say, with foundations locally. We, one of the local foundations absolutely said, we're energized by what this means and we'd like to support it and make sure that it's modeled locally. So to that extent, yes, a local, single local foundation made specific mention of it. But I think it's more a contextual general argument about a museum that it's prepared to do this. It's meant to elicit greater trust. And some of that is just going to be subliminal, that individual patrons will look at us through a different lens. And a lot of them comment to us that they appreciate it. But I think it's, it's basically building a baseline of trust. And from that, of course, support can flow. Well, we did an experiment a couple of years ago with a very antiseptic approach. We put glasses on people and followed the direction of their eyeballs in relation to the work of art and the label. And we were able to notice that they spent most of their time looking at the label and then flicked up and looked at the object. So there was a very clear, scientistic way of starting to analyze human behavior, <laughs> literally their behavior, their physical behavior in a gallery. But it's the most primitive kind. I think museums are afraid of emotion. Uh, we're doing a major exhibition in, in the fall called uh, Sacred Spain, which will have dozens of wonderful 17th century Baroque objects, mostly from the Prado and museums in Spain and from Peru and Mexico, all of which were processional. They were used in worship and conversion. They are, many of them, dripping with painted blood. They have movable arms for, for the image of Christ carried in processions very recently. Our new media team was recently was in Spain last week filming all of this. There's an example of an exhibition that is about the sacral in art which can be very potent in tapping into religiosity or into the, simply the, the corporeal reality of objects made at a time when objects of art and, and articles of faith were coincident. And we expect people to pray in the galleries. We expect there to be that kind of emotional resonance from these objects which were made for that intent. We don't intend to discourage that. But I think it's tricky in museums like ours where the responses can be personal. They can be elicited on a very personal level. And you don't want to structure or provide a structured environment for that. And so much of what happens in an art museum is purely an accident of encounter or the relevance of something to someone else. But the Detroit Institute of Arts, I think, did a very good job in trying to do a new approach of display uh, last year, where they, they sought to make an invitational experience in looking make a much more informal approach to wall text and copy that invited people to associate things in ways that weren't art historical. They were emotional. And I, I think that needs to continue. Okay. The Twitter question that's long gone by had, was relating transparency to the, um, the question of, of provenance research. And it would seem to me that that's a place where, particularly within the um, community of the Association of Art Museum Directors, there has been an increase in transparency. There has been an acknowledgment that, that that's a way that, that, that the museums could be more open. I'm wondering if you think that's a, that's a way in to encouraging your colleagues to share, share more, having, having made that, that commitment. Well, that commitment was really in 1996 when the Swiss vaults were, were yawning open and suddenly this cavalcade of information about the Holocaust and the associated misdeeds and the ways in which objects were spirited out became manifest. And suddenly we had an obligation. And that obligation was very strong, we felt, 13 years ago. Today, I think it's a typical phenomenon for most of our museums with art collections that might have acquired objects after 1933 that might have passed through a pressure sale. Those are all basically earmarked on websites. Actually, I think that's the easy example because the moral repugnance associated with that is so extreme 
that everyone flooded into in service of transparency, resolving to the extent we could with a living generation that is uh, really shrinking. But I think the harder one is when there isn't that moral pressure, when there isn't that sense of obligation that comes from an extrinsic pressure, whether it's that or a, a, an attorney general saying you blew it and you've got to fix yourselves publicly and wear a hair shirt. It's much harder to do when there's no pressure to do it, and that's precisely when it can be uh, the most powerful. That's an excellent question, and it's very much at the core of what has to come next. I think we've been invested in providing access, which is, as you all know, very tricky to do politically and in terms of just getting the politics of a place to be, to be abeasant to that <laughs> intent. And the next stage has to be what you're describing. We're, we don't claim to be there yet. We certainly have other opportunities to build that. But I, I think I'm, I leave that to much more talented people on the staff than me to understand where to go with it. I'm, I know our visitor services staff is excited about broadening that part of what we provide, as is education and marketing and everybody else who, who is engaged with the public on a daily basis. So you should expect to see more of that from us as from everybody else in the months to come. Well, yes, the non-visitor is such an important part of museum life, isn't it? That it's those individuals who, for whatever reason, don't come. We ask them. We have focus groups in, in town and ask why you don't visit our museum. And the answer is used to be it because you cost too much. And that's, we were already free. So um, <laughs> there, there is no question that that challenge is an almost insurmountable one in some respects of assuming that every person in the blogosphere in a neighborhood is going to want to go to a museum. I recognize that's not going to happen. I recognize that there are people for whom it simply will never be a priority, and I don't despair of it. I'd like to change their minds, but so be it. I think the non-visitor, of course, for us is huge because we're in Indianapolis. I think you've noticed that by now. And uh, <laughs> it isn't the center of the universe in some respects. We'd, we'd like to think it is in, in some respects. Certainly for us it is. But for us it's especially important not being in on one of the two coasts of the United States to make a case for ourselves online and recognize that the vast majority of people who turn to our website and the other resources we work on are never going to see us in person. So a big part of what we're trying to provide through Art Babel is the experiential element that is a substitute for being on site, whether it's interviewing artists here or in their studios, wherever they are in the world, or providing access to an experience about the process of making art or conserving art or displaying art, understanding that for the vast majority of our public, they'll never be here. And that's OK. We don't obsess about it. But I don't know, I don't think we've probably walked up to what you're saying is to recognize that not everyone is going to visit the Indianapolis Museum of Art. I think we could, we would certainly be crushed if we acknowledge that. And I think instead our process is to think, how can we reach as many people as possible through informal invitations through video right now as the basis. Yeah, well, I guess I look at it as the visit to a museum can be transformative in your life. I took our son to the Musée de la Marine in Paris this summer, hoping he would have the same response I did when I was his age of seeing galleons in miniature from the 17th century. It didn't seem to work. You know, it, he, he thought it was interesting, but I was so full of passion in telling him about Tintin and Capitan Adoc and the experiences I had as a boy reading comic books about ship models, and it just wasn't his thing. So after that visit, I have sought, unsuccessfully I would add, to get him more interested in ship models for whatever reason. It's just become now an obsession. And <laughs> I'm just tunneling myself deeper and deeper. And so there are times when... A, after visiting a museum, you're not going to have a connection. But I hope in many cases we can find ways to broaden and deepen the experience of a visit by getting it into the curriculum of schools, getting art back into the curriculum of schools, getting families to visit as a group, as we do with third graders, so that they will return to an institution based on what they might see in an internet connection in a library or a, a cafe or at home or in school or at work, 
And our effort is really to try to get repeat visitors because we know, we measure how many times people come to, to our museum. And that's why the attendance statistic is such a piece of nonsense because the same people come four times or five times a year. So the attendance of the museum is not the number of individuals. But for the same reason, we, we think it's exciting to try to get people back by luring them into greater depth of understanding about what they have seen on one visit through the new works on display widget to say, you've come once, but look at all the things that are up freshly since you were last here. So it's one technique that we're using among many. Thank you, Max. I think you've, you've given us a wonderful way to start thinking about the why of what we do, start really reflecting on, on why it is we struggle so much with the more, the more mundane things that are about the mechanics of putting museums on the web and making museum content accessible and engaging and, and, and enriching. And you've left us with a cautionary tale, and that's that not everybody's interested in ship models. <laughs> and we have to realize that, that what, makes, what drives us institutionally or what drives us individually isn't necessarily the thing that, that our visitors are going to connect with. And I think one of our biggest challenges as museums is, is, is respecting, accepting and respecting the, the complete diversity of our audiences and never knowing which point it is we're going to, to spark the moment of creativity and connection that, that could change a lifetime. Thank you very Thanks, much Jennifer. and very thank much. you everybody for, for thank being you. here and for engaging as well as you thank have. You.